hello guys how are you welcome back to your own youtube channel arls updates and uh, recent exams for more updates related to our recent arls exam writing task topics listening reading practice tasks on daily basis subscribe for more videos for every day listening practice task join today to achieve your dream score Please hit the like and subscribe button, press the bell icon for the upcoming notifications. Don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page as updates and recent exams. Part 1 You will hear a conversation between a man and a woman discussing the first day at a new job for the woman. First you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 5. Hi, Louisa. Thanks for coming in. No problem, Robert. What do you need from me? Well, as you're starting work here at Group 8 Security in a couple of days, I have to get you registered in our security system. First, I need to get some information from you. No problem. What do you need first? We'll start with your date of birth. It's the 4th of April, 1994. And what's your full name? It's Louisa Jennifer Griffiths. How do you spell Griffiths? G-R-I-F-F-I-T-H-S. Thank you. And what's your full address? 45 Sherburn Road, Greenham. What's the postcode for that address? It's G-H-6-7-H-Y. Can I take a phone number for you? Of course. My home phone number is 01483 759 742. Can I have your cell phone number as well? As that's often much easier to use. Of course. My cell number is 07854 375 986. Can you say that number again, please? O seven eight five four three seven five nine eight six. Now, am I right in saying that you're entering the company at grade five? Yes, that's correct. And do you know yet in which section you'll be? To start with, I'm with Home Security on the fourth floor. Thanks. That's all the basics done. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at question six to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 6 to 10. So now I'd like to tell you what to do on your first day here. Yes, that would be useful. You should try to arrive at around 8 in the morning. When you first come in, go to the reception and ask for Anna. She'll be expecting you and will give you your ID badge. This will give you access to all parts of the building. Do I need to give you a photo? No, the one on your application form was fine, and we've used that. After meeting Anna, go to the fourth floor, where your department head will meet you. He'll give you a quick tour of your department, and then the whole building. Then, at 10 o'clock, go to the meeting room on the eighth floor, where you'll have a two-hour orientation. You'll do things like giving your social security number and bank details for your salary. You'll receive your passwords for the computers and copiers, and there will also be legal papers to sign and various other pieces of paperwork to deal with. 
At my last job, I used to bring in a flask of coffee for myself. Can I do that here? Sure, if you want to. We have drink stations on every floor, though. And there is tea, coffee, water and juices freely available all day. So you don't need to bring in anything yourself. There are also rolls there, in case you need a snack during the day. That's very useful. We have a canteen in the basement where there are subsidised meals available. You can go there for lunch after your orientation. Most staff go there for lunch as it's cheap and the food is quite good. Sometimes people eat out for a change though. Well, I'll definitely try it out at first. After lunch, you'll go back to your department and you'll be shown where you'll be working. I expect your department will get you looking at the initial project that you'll be working on. What are the actual hours that I need to be here? It really depends on the project that you're working on. But as a general rule, we start here between 7 and 10 in the morning and people leave between 4 and 7 in the evening. Lunch can be taken at any time between 11 and 3. As long as you do your contracted 8 hours a day, you can start and finish quite flexibly. Do I need to sign in and out every day? You swipe your ID every time you enter and leave the building. So signing in and out is all done automatically. This is also helpful as it allows us to know who's in the building at any one time in case of a fire. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a woman presenting a radio show on mountain gorillas. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully to the radio show and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Linda Wilkinson, and I've been invited in today to talk about the endangered mountain gorilla. Few animals capture the imagination more than this extraordinary creature, but tragically, its numbers are woefully small. However, what might have been a depressing future for the mountain gorilla just a couple of decades ago has brightened in recent years due to conservation efforts. This isn't to say that the situation isn't still very, very frightening. Right now, the overall mountain gorilla population is approximately 800, an increase from the 786 estimated two years ago. Gorillas, like all wild animals, play an important role in their environment. Without these large-scale grazers eating lots of vegetation, the natural equilibrium in the food chain would be disrupted. There are various reasons why the mountain gorillas have become so endangered. To start with, they live in a very challenging environment, with extreme cold from the elevation of where they live. Then, although the mountain gorilla was not even known to science until 1902, a combination of hunting, disease, and habitat destruction has driven this very rare primate to the verge of extinction. We are happy to say, though, that despite ongoing civil conflict, continued poaching, and an encroaching human population, populations of mountain gorillas have had this increase in numbers. Many people believe that the habitat reduction has led to a problem in finding prey, but it's perhaps surprising that an animal as large and strong as the mountain gorilla is primarily a herbivore. 
They eat over a hundred different species of plants, and they rarely need to drink, since their diet is so rich in herbs from which they get their water. Other things that they eat include leaves, shoots, and stems of herbaceous vegetation. These plants are all easily found in the types of mountainous forests where the gorilla is found. Habitat loss is one of the most severe threats to gorilla populations, and the forests where mountain gorillas live are surrounded by rapidly increasing human settlements. The main issue leading to habitat loss is that, as humans have moved into areas near mountain gorillas, they have cleared land so that farming can expand. Even land within protected areas is not safe from clearing. For example, three years ago, illegal settlers cleared 3,700 acres of mountain gorilla forest in one prominent national park. In addition to this, inside mountain gorilla habitats, people utilize charcoal for cooking and heating, and habitat clearance to produce this has also led to the destruction of a lot of the areas where mountain gorilla live. You now have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the radio show and answer questions 16 to 20. I'd like now to tell you a little bit about the organization I work with, which is called Life Plus. We work with a variety of endangered animals, including the mountain gorilla. Recently, we've actually been able to buy some mountain gorilla habitat in Rwanda, and we're developing a protection and development program that will allow us to nurture the mountain gorilla population living in our area. I'd like now to tell you something about the gorillas in our care. I find our gorillas just like people, and their characters are as clear to me now as the characters of my own friends. The most imposing character is definitely Simba, and he's the dominant male in our group. Simba, of course, means lion in Swahili, and we gave him this name because of his imposing bulk. Because of his size and demeanor, you'd expect Simba to be highly aggressive. But, although he can be with other males who challenge him, he is incredibly compassionate and is often the first of the group to comfort others in distress, for example, if they're sick. The prettiest of our gorillas is Linda. She's three years old and is a very popular site for tourists who visit our area. She's not that easy to find or see because she is wary of visitors and will often disappear into the undergrowth if she hears or sees the telltale signs of a group approaching her. Linda has recently become a mother, and so she's become an even more popular sight. We of course have to restrict how often people view her, as we don't want to distress her in any way now that she's caring for her baby. The opposite to Linda is Jojo. She enjoys having tourists close by, and although we always try and keep our distance, Jojo will often try and get close. This is wonderful for our visitors, who get to see a gorilla close up, and it gives them great opportunities to get some great snapshots. Our largest female is Layla, but we're a bit worried about her. The last time she was spotted, it was noted that she was pregnant. Since then, she's gone out of sight for a couple of weeks. She's not that old, and she didn't seem as though she was sick, but until we see her again, we'll continue to be a little concerned. It's not that unusual behavior, though, so we're expecting everything to be all right. A lot of people's favorite is Tomo. He's full of drive and vigor, and he's always playing with the others and climbing and running. He's one that really needs to sleep well at night so that he can continue his crazy lifestyle during the day. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear three students discussing arrangements for a geography field trip. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi Sally. Hi Chris. Are you looking for me? Hi Lizzie. Yes, we are. We wanted to go through the arrangements for our geography field trip to Wales. Are you free? Yes, I am. That's a good idea. Sit down here. So, shall I start? The trip will start on the 18th of June, which is a Monday. I suggest we meet in front of the student laundrette on Manchester Road. I think we should get an early start and leave at 5am. That way we can do three hours driving before the rush hour starts. I reckon that it will then take a further two hours to drive to Conway in North Wales, which is where we'll be staying. And what will we do when rush hour starts? I thought we'd all be ready to pause by then. The drivers certainly will be. I think we should pause at a cafe and have breakfast or just a drink and then get going again at around 9.30. Then we'd get to Conway at around midday if we're lucky with the traffic. That sounds like a good plan. Who's going to drive? I'm in charge of transport. As there will be 12 of us altogether, I've booked a 14-seater minibus. It should be big enough for all of us and all our luggage. Chris and Jennifer have offered to drive. I can do some driving too, if you want. Thanks, Lizzie. But the problem is that you have to be 23 years old, or older, to drive the minibus. And I know that you're 21, like me. That's why I didn't ask you already. Only Chris and Jennifer are old enough. How much will the transport cost? We have the minibus for a week. We only need it for six days, but the deal for a week was cheaper than for six days. Six days was £450, but a week was £408. Another company I checked was cheaper at £350, but I was warned off then. So that only comes to £34 each. That's a great price. I thought so. And what about the field trip arrangements once we're there? I've organised that bit as well. We'll be there four nights, so we come back on Friday afternoon. On Monday afternoon, as we only have a half day, we're going to stay in town and do the research on the beach and town development. There will be three groups of four. I don't have the exact list with me as I left it at home, but it's all done. We can do the beach measurements and interview some of the hotel and shop owners. The town museum knows we're coming and they'll have lots of historical data in their records for us. And the other days? On Tuesday, we're due at Manor Farm for the whole day. They're almost unique as the farm's topography goes from quite high hills right down to the sea's edge. And Wednesday? We drive inland from the sea and we'll meet a guide to take us up into the North Wales mountains where we'll spend the day. We'll focus on a valley about an hour's walk from the road. The valley has a small river running through it and its other features will be perfect for the type of research that we need to do. What will we do for food that day? I suppose there won't be any shops nearby. We'll have breakfast at the hostel, and then they'll give us a packed lunch for the day. We'll be back at the hostel in time for dinner. And what will we do on Thursday? We'll look at the historical section of our trip. Part of what we need to do is to analyse the geographical implications of historical settlements. Conway has an old castle, and so we can spend the day in and around it and do our research. The castle also has a museum, and that will help us with some aspects of this study. What about Friday morning, as we don't leave until lunchtime? We'll have the morning free. Probably we'll just need that time to collate and organise all our work that we'll have done over the week. You now have some time to look at questions 26 to 30.
Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 26 to 30. So Lizzie, you were in charge of accommodation at the hostel. What have you sorted out? The hostel does not have small rooms, so we'll have to be together in small dormitories. The girls are on the first floor. Sally, you, Jennifer and I will be in room three, which is first on the right after you come up the stairs from the ground floor. It has three single beds. It's quite small, but it does have an ensuite bathroom with a separate bath and shower and also a toilet. The second girl's room is room two, which is on the left after you come up the stairs. It's for Sarah, Angela and Wendy. There is one single bed and one bunk bed there. We boys will be on the second floor then. That's right. You have the same two rooms as the girls, but one floor up. The smaller room at the en suite is for you, Simon and Sebastian. And the larger room is for Robin, Alex and Leon. They have a bigger room, but they'll need to use the communal bathroom, which is on the left when you come out of their room. That's the same for the girls below. You boys will have the advantage of full computer use, but apparently the router can't operate correctly on the girls' floor, so we'll have to do without. The dining room is on the third floor, so everyone will need to go there in order to get breakfast. When are the meals? Breakfast is from half past six. They don't do lunch apart from pack lunches. Dinner is from six until eight. There's a bell to indicate the start of both meals. It will be fairly plain food, but they told me there'll be plenty of it. Is there any security at the hostel? Yes, we will get keys for all the rooms, though we need to give the hostel a deposit for each key. At night, the front doors are locked from 11pm. They are unlocked from 6am. When the doors are unlocked, there's always someone on duty in the reception. Anything else? If we've got any energy left at the end of the day... The hostel organises walks around the town in the evening. We can join that or watch a film. They show a film every evening in the common room. Well, it seems as though most things are organised. Shall we go off to our next class now? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear part of a lecture on alternative power sources. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning, and welcome to this lecture on alternative power sources. As you know, we've been focusing recently on solar power, and today we want to continue this theme by looking at how solar energy can be harnessed to power planes. Solar aviation began with model aircrafts in the 1970s, when affordable solar cells appeared on the market. However, it was not until 1980 that the first human flights were realized. The Solar Challenger, 
with a maximum power of 2.5 kilowatts, succeeded in crossing the English Channel on its maiden flight in suspect weather in 1981, and continued across France, covering distances of several hundred kilometers, landing only for service checks. By the end, the battery was exhausted, but its mission had been completed. In 1990, the American-built Sunseeker crossed the United States in 21 stages and 121 flying hours over a period of almost two months. In the middle of the 1990s, several airplanes were built to participate in the Bear Blinger competition. Since 1988, the town of Ohm has been awarding the Berblinger Prize from time to time as a tribute to the work of Albrecht Ludwig Berblinger, the tailor of Ohm, and his attempt to fly across the Danube in 1811. This prize is awarded for original inventive and creative ideas in the field of general aviation, with a focus of interest on safety, environmental sustainability, aerodynamics, construction design, and economy. The aim was to be able to climb to an altitude of 450 meters with the aid of batteries and to maintain horizontal flight with solar energy power of at least 500 watts per square meter, which corresponds to about half of the power emitted by the sun at midday on the equator. One must not also forget Helios, developed by another American company for NASA. This remote-controlled unmanned aircraft with a wingspan of more than 70 meters, established a record altitude of nearly 30,000 meters in 2001. Surprise turbulence during a later flight led to its breakup and a crash into the Pacific Ocean. You now have some time to look at questions. Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions. Recently, a Swiss team developed the Solar Impulse, a solar-powered design that has taken the ideas of the early pioneers and developed solar-powered planes to an unprecedented level. The Solar Impulse HBSIA prototype presents physical and aerodynamic features never seen before, with its huge wingspan equal to that of an Airbus A340, yet only as heavy as an average car. These factors place the solar impulse in yet unexplored flight envelope. With 200 square meters of photovoltaic cells and a 12% total efficiency of the propulsion chain, the plane's motors achieve an average power of 8 horsepower, or 6 kilowatts. That's roughly the amount of power the Wright brothers had available to them in 1903 when they made their first powered flight. And it is with that energy optimized from the solar panel to the propeller that Solar Impulse has managed to fly day and night without fuel. The 12,000 or so photovoltaic cells of 145 microns of monocrystalline silicon combine lightness and efficiency. Their efficiency could have been even higher, like the panels used in space, but their weight would then have been much too high, penalizing the plane during the night flight. This phase is the most critical and the plane's batteries must be fully charged. The batteries are the main constraint in the plane's design, and they require a drastic reduction of the weight of the rest of the plane. So as to optimize the whole energy chain and to maximize the aerodynamic performance provided by using a high aspect ratio wing alongside a low speed profile. Four pods are fixed under the wings. Each contains a brushless, sensorless electric motor a polymer lithium battery consisting of 70 accumulators, and a management system controlling the change in temperature thresholds. The insulation has been designed to conserve the heat radiated by the batteries and keep them functioning despite the minus 40 degrees Celsius encountered at 8,500 meters. Each motor has a maximum power output of 10 horsepower. You now have some time to look at questions
Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions. The solar impulses batteries work like most other solar batteries. Pointed towards the sun, solar panels capture the energy in sunlight and convert it directly to DC electricity, which is passed down to the charge controller, which operates the solar array at its maximum efficiency and feeds the electricity into the battery bank. It also protects the battery bank from overcharging, as when the battery bank is fully charged, it interrupts the flow of electricity from the solar panels. Batteries are expensive, and lose potency when under or overcharged, so this process extends the life of the batteries. Finally, as DC current is usually not needed, the inverter transforms the solar-produced DC electricity into the AC electricity commonly used. That is the end of part 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Thanks for listening and God bless you all. Don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page. I'll update our recent exam. For everyday listening practice test, for more material visit my website www.altsupdatesandrecentexams.com The link is also given below in the description. Please write your score below the comment section and please like and subscribe my channel for more hours listening practice tests on daily basis. Again, thanks for listening. God bless you all.